Let's turn again to the book of Revelation, chapters 10 and 11 that we read earlier this morning. The time of the end begins. In our world, there can be no substantial change without upheaval. We've seen that recently, haven't we? Um, in many of the Arab countries, there was something recently called the Arab Spring, where the people took to the streets demanding a greater say in how their country was run. Throughout history, there have been times of upheaval and um, demonstration. Sometimes we see demonstrations in our own streets. We've seen them recently, but I have to say some of them have been rather poor. And I, for one, think people are angry about lockdown and restrictions, and it's coming out in a variety of unpleasant ways. <clears throat> However, if we think that the ultimate change of the coming in of the kingdom of God will come without a huge amount of upheaval, we would be mistaken. Exactly what kind of upheaval must take place before Christ can come and reign as King of Kings upon the earth. A terrible time of upheaval will take place, but it will be necessary. Evil will have its final swing, if you like, before the Lord intervenes and takes his rightful place upon the throne. And so, that's why I've titled our thoughts, The Time of the End Begins. There is such a thing as the time of the end. And the prophets throughout scripture have spoken about this for many years. And as we get to Revelation 10 and 11, we begin to see some of the events of the time of the end. And they are specifically located in time. I, I was speaking to another theologian recently, and he uh, basically accused me of uh, making up my mind about these things without having studied them. I said, what, the last 30 years of study doesn't count? Hey, is that what you mean? If you look through the text of Scripture as we shall, you will begin to see clues. You will not see the whole picture. You will see clues about what is going on. And I you will, I hope, have your attention drawn to the fact uh, that some theories and beliefs about the book of Revelation simply cannot be correct. For very obvious and logical reasons, as you read the text. And as we come to them, I'll, I'll try and point them out to you uh, as to... Uh, certain points of exegesis you could reject. That can't be right. It must be something else. And as you go through putting these, this jigsaw together of what, what the scripture could be saying and what it's definitely not saying, you'll begin to have, you know, when you put that jigsaw together, the picture slowly starts to form. I've never been much good at jigsaws, mind you. And as we go through the book of Revelation from chapter 10, we're not going to see things entirely in chronological order. There is some chronology. We are moving towards the time of the end. However, we will see um, different points of view, uh, different details of the time of the end in different chapters. Not necessarily happening at different times, but the chapters kind of merge together in, to give us one picture of the time of the end. We begin in chapter 10 with John being given the message concerning the end times. He sees this mighty angel in verse 1 coming down from heaven. He plants one foot on the land and the other foot on the sea. Remember, God's authority is over all creation. And when this angel comes down, he is clothed with the authority of God. His description, in fact, it is reminiscent of John's earlier picture of Jesus Christ himself, that this angel is not Jesus Christ. Rather, as Mr. Wesley said, the angel reflects the glory of God and is sent with Christ's authority. This powerful being descends with evidences of Christ's power to deliver a message from the Lord to John. You remember right at the beginning of Revelation how the book says, uh, it's the revelation that comes from Jesus Christ. It's the revelation of him. But he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John. So angels are the messengers bringing the message. This angel is surrounded by a cloud of glory. It says there was a, a rainbow around his head, but he was clothed with a cloud. That's the cloud of God's glory, reminding us that Christ ascended to heaven in clouds of glory and will return from heaven 
in clouds of glory. The rainbow is symbolic, of course, of God's covenant with his people. Remember the covenant in the days of Noah. He put the uh, rainbow in the sky as a sign he would never break his covenant, and he never has. The angel's face shone like the sun, the radiance that told of his might. Just as the face of Jesus is described in Revelation chapter 1, there is tremendous power here. The angel has been given a task that he will fulfill in his Lord's name. His feet planted on the earth and sea are like pillars of fire, for he is able to subdue all things by his strength. Now that kind of power can only be given by Jesus Christ. But this angel has been given the task of revealing to John greater detail about the time of the end. We know that Daniel had revealed details at the time of the end. Uh, and other prophets have. Now John was going to reveal even more. I love the fact that the angel brings a little book. It's a little book. There's not a huge amount here for us to learn. But it's an open book. What God wants to make known in the book of Revelation. He, he isn't trying to hide it. He isn't trying to cover it up. He isn't trying to make it so difficult that nobody can possibly understand it. It's an open book. John, I want you to take this open book and I want you to deliver the message that everyone may see it and everyone may understand it. The contents of the little book were meant to be fully disclosed. That's why it's open. I hope your Bible's open every day because then you'll find God's will and his way for your life fully disclosed to you if you read the scriptures and not just your favourite part but the whole of it. From Genesis to Revelation, you'll find in there all that you need. And here in Revelation, God tells us things we need to know about the time of the end. The roar of this angel's voice is like the roar of a lion, a great shout. And that roar is answered by a sevenfold thunder. The source of the thunder is not made clear. It's quite reasonable to think, though, that the thunder came from heaven itself. As, of course, the psalmist reminds us, and I'm going to quote to you from Psalm 29, uh, that from heaven, the God, the, the voice of the Lord is over the waters, the God of glory thunders. The voice of the Lord is powerful. So this could well be the voice of God thundering his message from heaven. But whatever the message, it was not to be revealed at that time. No doubt it will be revealed at the time of the end. Now, Brother Bob Cox used to suppose that these thunderings were blasphemous thunderings from the seven-headed beast, that each of the seven thunders, <coughs> the head of the beast, you know, seven heads, that represented blasphemous things occurring. But there are no evil beasts around in chapter 10 in this vision, so I think it more likely that since the angel has come down from heaven and has been given a command by God, the thundering comes from God. It's something that the angel and John had to know. Something we don't yet need to know. Remarkable. But that should tell us something. There's something here God thinks we don't need to know. Something he doesn't want us to know. Which just once again illustrates the fact that the book of the Revelation, the words he has given us, he does want us to know. And he does want us to understand. He doesn't want to make it so difficult that, uh, you know, you, you need to be able to speak 27 different languages and have degrees from 56 universities before you can even understand it. The simpler you are in the way you approach the text of this book, the more chance you have of understanding it, in my opinion. The angel has brought a message about the time of the end, and it's a solemn message. With a solemn oath in the name of the eternal God of creation, he swears that this time, the time when the seven trumpet sounds, was the time for God's will to be accomplished. His wrath would be poured out on the earth and his son would return to reign in glory. When the seventh trumpet sounds in 1115, God's purpose for humanity would be completed just as he had made known through his servants the prophets. The whole message of the prophets is building up to this time when the kingdom of God comes. And why? Well, because the king comes. 
from God. And he reigns upon the earth. Notice upon the earth. This is the reign of Christ in this world. Before there is ever a new heaven and a new earth. And his reign will be forever. But the Lord tells John in verse 8 to go up and take the open book from the angel's hand. And he asks the angel for it. And the angel gives him some instructions, doesn't he? Tells him to eat it. Devour it. Take in every word of its message thoroughly. Remember, this is a vision, and this is a symbol. John would have literally, in the vision, took the book and ate it up. And that was symbolic to us of the importance of the message. It had to become part of the messenger, and he had to speak it out from the heart. But the angel warns John that although reading this book would be sweet, like eating honey, digesting it, or understanding it, would give great discomfort. In other words, it's a solemn message. It carries a wonderful prospect, the coming of Christ, the glory of God, our wonderful future revealed in Jesus. But there is a solemn aspect of God's judgment upon the ungodly and the unbelieving. It would be difficult for John to prophesy about such things. Any man of God should have a broken heart when prophesying or preaching about the judgment to come. If you get up and preach about the judgment to come in anger, sit down. You're not called of God to preach. If you preach about the judgment of God, I hope that you're as broken as God is about the subject. It was essential for John to prophesy about the time of the end. The subject is of the deepest importance to every people, tribe and nation and language on the earth. I would suggest that the contents of this little book are the subject of John's prophecies in the coming chapters in the book of Revelation. The angel says to him, you must prophesy again to the whole world. And he does. And then we begin to see, after he's eaten the book, John's visions of the end. Interestingly, they begin centering around the nation of Israel. And they are specifically taken up with the time on earth immediately prior to the coming of the Lord. All of these prophecies, every one of them, finish up with Jesus coming back. Okay. And so it's reasonable to suppose that everything happening just before the bit where it says Jesus came back is immediately leading up to that point. That's, that's just common sense. The time on earth prior to the coming of the Lord will be a time of great trouble for the people of Israel. We're told here in the scriptures that it would last 42 months or three and a half years. Notice how John is taken by the spirit, sorry, in the spirit by the angel to Jerusalem. In, we're in chapter 11 and verse 1. I know he's been taken to Jerusalem. I'll come to that in a moment for several reasons. Notice he's only told to measure the part of the temple that was used by Jews. Leave out the court outside the temple. Do not measure it. It has been given to the Gentiles. They will tread the holy city underfoot for 42 months. So this is no temple in heaven. There aren't any Gentiles trampling heaven under their feet. This is on earth. And it is the temple in Jerusalem. Have you ever wondered why there are some Christians who believe the temple in Jerusalem will need to be rebuilt? It's because of prophecies like this and in Ezekiel and also some of the writings of Paul. There has to be a temple in Jerusalem immediately prior to the coming of the Lord. If anyone says nonsense, you know, they're the same sort of people who, you know, through the centuries did not seem to consider that when Jesus said Jerusalem would be trodden underfoot by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled, they didn't seem to consider that he would bring Israel back to the land and Israel would become a nation again, which happened in 1948. People overlook the literal fulfillment of God's prophetic word because it doesn't fit in with their agenda very often or their politics. Measuring the temple and measuring the worshippers could be a reference to counting their number. But as some commentators suggest, it may in fact measure the sincerity of their devotion. 
Whatever the case, John was not to measure the court of the Gentiles. They had been rejected by God. They had dominated Jerusalem by ruthless oppression and merciless brutality. And uh, indeed, they would do so at the time of the end. Once again, the Gentiles would be trampling Jerusalem underfoot, but only on this occasion for three and a half years. The first time that Jerusalem was trodden underfoot by the Gentiles, that was about 1900 years. But this uh, round two is only going to last 42 months. This is the time of Jacob's trouble, which Jeremiah spoke of in Jeremiah 30. And it's interesting that I have a numerous references to Jeremiah uh, concerning these chapters, uh, chapter 11 of Revelation. During this end time, God will raise up two prophets who will bear witness to all people of God's authority and judgment. The judgment he is about to bring on them. Notice these two witnesses in 11.3, they prophesy 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. That's how solemn their message is. They are identified as being the two spoken of in Zechariah 4 who wait on God continually as his servants. The two olive trees, the two lampstands, they're the same two individuals. And there has been a huge amount of speculation as to their identity, but that is unhelpful. <clears throat> Some say, oh, do you think they might be Moses and Elijah? Well, remember the Jews were waiting for Elijah to come, and Jesus said he had come. But it wasn't Elijah at all, it was John the Baptist. He wasn't a reincarnated Elijah, he wasn't Elijah born again. No, he was John, the son of Zechariah and Elizabeth. But he fulfilled the role of Elijah. And I happen to think it is most likely these two men belong to the time in which they minister. Okay? They're not anyone you've ever heard of. Their names aren't given. They're not important. But their function and their work shall certainly be important. They are not pictures of the church, as we shall see again from some of the details we come across. That <coughs> cannot possibly be. Indeed, it is highly likely that they are not Christians in the sense that we understand the word Christian. They are from among the Jewish community, although indeed perhaps Messianic Jews. In verse 5, we see the supernatural power they are given to kill anyone who tries to stop them. It says fire proceeds from their mouth. I wouldn't take this as a literal fire. The word of God will be so powerful from their lips that it will consume their enemies. If they speak the word of God's judgment, it will happen immediately. That's what it means here. You know, in Jeremiah, once again, Jeremiah was told in 5.14, Because you speak this word, behold, I will make my words in your mouth like fire, and this people like wood, and it shall devour them. It's important to understand that sometimes judge, God's judgment can be instant. Have you ever experienced that? When you've spoken something in the name of Jesus, when you've commended something to God according to his word, and he has acted swiftly against those that oppose the word of Christ, and they've died in front of you? Have you seen that? Some of us have. Frequently. These witnesses will speak the word of God in such a way that their enemies will actually be judged where they stand. In verse 6, they have power to stop it raining during the time of their prophecy, to turn the waters into blood and strike the earth with all kinds of plagues as often as they wish. That's why people think of Moses when they think of these two uh, witnesses. And the plagues of Egypt are called to mind frequently, throughout the book of Revelation. And I don't think anyone reading the text of Revelation, in the first century at least, would doubt that the plagues of Egypt were literal, actual, they happened, they were the judgment of God. We need to take that into account when we understand what is said here. Literal, actual judgments of God on the earth. 
The whole ministry of the two witnesses, and this is what, one of the reasons why I say they cannot possibly stand for the church, their ministry is one of judgment. There's not a word of salvation here. There's not a message of forgiveness here. There's not an opportunity to repent here. It's judgment, judgment, judgment. That's not the church's ministry. That is the ministry of the prophets. But these two witnesses, clearly human, for they die. In verse 7. When the two witnesses have finished their God-given task, the beast who arises out of the abyss is permitted of God to overcome and kill them. Remember I said how you get different views of the same incidents across Revelation. We haven't even met the beast yet, yet John is referring to him here as the one who has these two prophets killed. It's the first mention of the beast, but later we will see him rising out of the sea in Revelation 13 verse 1. And this makes clear that the two witnesses stand for God during the worldwide reign of the beast, also called the Antichrist. So if you want to time the period in which these two witnesses function and minister, it is during that three and a half years when the beast rules. What is the location? Well, in verses 8 and 9 we see where their dead bodies are left to rot. The place where they have been ministering. Spiritually, it is referred to, says John, as Sodom. Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 10 is, that's where Isaiah used the word Sodom to describe Jerusalem. Spiritually, says Isaiah, Jerusalem is likened to Sodom because of its iniquity and its sin. The moral corruption of the city is signified by that word Sodom. Egypt refers to its spiritual bondage to Satan. It is called Sodom and it is called Egypt and it is the place, says John, and it was still very fresh in his memory, where our Lord was crucified outside the city wall of Jerusalem. So have you got the, the, the time now, that three and a half year period, the beast, Antichrist, is ruling. These witnesses minister in the city of Jerusalem. And the focus of much of the latter part of Revelation is right there in the land of Israel. Hardly surprising that it should be that the one who is coming to reign on David's throne should find the forces of darkness arrayed against him before his coming in the very place where he's supposed to reign. The dead bodies of these two prophets will not be allowed burial. People from many nations will gloat over them. They'll even come to view their bodies, not satisfied with the pictures. Their bodies will remain three and a half days there in the street. And those who dwell on earth, says verse 10, will rejoice over them. They will celebrate the death of these two antagonists. Oh, can you imagine? You know, you've seen some of the evil and hate, haven't you? That is going around at the present time. Um, I, I hate when I see placards saying, kill the bill. I don't want to get political. This isn't a political point. I know some people are talking about a, a bill in the House of Commons. But hang on. Those placards I saw kill the bill, and the bill was in blue. And then they go to attack the old bill and beat him up. That's a lot of hate, isn't it? Yes. But that's nothing compared to the hatred the unreasonable, satanic hatred the people of earth will have for these two prophets. They'll have a holiday when they die. Throw parties. Send presents to each other. I feel disgusted when I see that pure cremation advert on the television. Wow. They just come and collect your body, cremate you and bring the remains back. There's no funeral, there's no mourning. Uh, and they say, oh, well, they can use the money to have a party. No wonder Revelation talks about the judgment of God. I don't know who runs pure cremation, but they better start running. And asking the rocks to hide them from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. The people of earth rejoice when they no longer have to hear these rebukes, the word of truth. They no longer have to put up with these men who oppose the prevailing errors and rebuke the vices of the age. 
You can't tell people what sin is anymore. They don't want to know. It's as if the spirit of the very last days has already begun to affect the human race. Mind you, it's nothing new. It's always been there. It's sin. It's rebellion against God. It's hostility, enmity towards the, the, the Almighty. But in the last days, it will become, you know, it will reach a crescendo. It will reach its peak. And that is the time for judgment to fall. God is so patient, he allows men to get just as bad as they possibly can before he unwillingly sends his judgment. Let's look then at God's statement to the whole world during this period as the two witnesses are raised from death to life. Verses 11 and 12, after three and a half days, important three and a half days, God didn't want it to be three days. He doesn't want us getting muddled up between Jesus' resurrection after three days and these people's resurrection. So significantly, it was three and a half days. But the spirit of life from God enters them. They are raised from the dead. They stand on their feet in front of the whole world looking on. And this brings abject terror to those who witness it. Then there's a shout, and the Lord shouts from heaven to these two witnesses, and they ascend to heaven in a cloud of glory with the whole world looking on. By now, world, you are without excuse, surely. They say, show me a miracle and I'll believe. No, you won't. 13 and 14. That same hour, a powerful earthquake destroyed one-tenth of the city of Jerusalem, killing 7,000 people, giving us a little bit of a clue as to the population of Jerusalem at the time. We're not talking huge numbers here. God's judgment for their opposition to his witnesses. Those who survive in mortal fear will attribute this act to the power of God, though perhaps like Pharaoh before them, they still are among those we read about in Revelation 9.21 that refuse to repent. Pharaoh saw all the miracles of God getting greater and greater, and he got harder and harder, hardened his heart against them. The second of the three woes is now past, and the third one will follow immediately, which is actually coincident with the sounding of the seventh trumpet. The end of all things is announced in verses 15 to 19. By the way, why are these things important? When St. Paul was asked the question, and this is 2 Thessalonians, about the coming of the Lord, there was a false prophecy going round that Jesus had already come back. And Paul wanted to, to make clear, he said, hang on, you know the things I've taught you. Jesus isn't going to come back until certain things have taken place on the earth. And I've enumerated some of them to you. And it, uh, among the things that Paul taught, he said, were about the Antichrist, the son of perdition, sitting in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. That's this time we're talking about here. And then the Lord Jesus will appear from heaven to destroy him without human hand. It's important to put these scriptures together and understand that they speak about the time of the end. Verse 15, the last of the trumpets is sounded, and it proclaims the end of all things. For John hears mighty voices in heaven proclaiming, the time had now come. The kingdom of the world would be in possession of God and of Christ. It would be taken out of the hands of Satan once and for all. The God of this world, he's called, and in the last days, he's been having his way. For a short time, he's been completely in control. But now, by the power of Christ, authority of the world was given back to its rightful owner. As Matthew Henry says in his commentary, they were always so in title, both by creation and purchase. But now he asserts his rights exerts his power, and turns title into possession. In other words, the world is God's. And now by, by his own authority, he's going to come over and say, right, this is mine. You know, like um, some of these raves that have been going on illegally. They were always illegal. And the police always have the right to break them up. 
On some occasions, they don't. They avoid confrontation. But the time comes when they have to go and say, right boys, go home, clear off. We're taking control. That's what God's going to do. The world is out of control like an illegal raid. And God's been looking on for some time, but now he's going to step in and say, right, time's up. I'm taking over. The 24 elders who, in some way, recall, uh, represent the church, they rise from their thrones at this event. They fall before God to worship him and express their gratitude because the Almighty has ex exercised his right to rule over the whole earth. What wonderful news for creation this is. What wonderful news for us as believers. But at this time, the heathen who were enraged against God and opposed Christ, persecuting his people, you see in verse 18, they will experience God's wrath. That's the downside. Whatever their position in life, time had come for them to be judged. On the other hand, it was also time for those whose names who were written in the book of life, who have faithfully served Christ, to be rewarded. It's interesting, you know, in verse 19, it talks about the temple of God being open in heaven. But we know there is no literal temple in heaven. By the way, when John talks about the temple in heaven, he tells us it's the temple in heaven. Yeah? So in Revelation 11, when he wants to tell us about the temple that's in heaven, right, he knows how to tell us about that. So the temple at the start of John 11, which wasn't in heaven, wasn't in heaven. You see what I mean? I might, this might sound ridiculous if you've never read a commentary on Revelation. But if you read a commentary on Revelation, you'll find some absurd nonsense, such as the temple in Revelation 11.1 1, is a temple in heaven. John doesn't say that's in heaven. He says it's on earth. The Gentiles are trampling it underfoot. It's in Jerusalem. People there get killed. But now we're, we're seeing the temple in heaven. John knows how to tell the difference between the two. And he clearly communicates to us that he's talking about something else. There's no room for getting muddled up here. But what's interesting is although there's no literal temple in heaven, the word temple refers to the place where God dwells. And this particular word for temple isn't the whole building, but it's the holy place. God's immediate presence, the holy place, was open. Judgment passed. The saints can enter in. The holy ark of the covenant, which held the law of God, the manna and Aaron's rod that budded, is pictured here in heaven too. The ark and a lid, of course, which was called the mercy seat. And on the Day of Atonement, the mercy seat was sprinkled with the blood of the sacrifice. It was from above the mercy seat that God spoke to Moses. In other words, the ark is a symbol giving assurance of God's promises, his presence and his covering for sin. If there is no literal temple in heaven, there is no literal ark. But Christ is the ark of the covenant to his people. When Stephen was being stoned to death, he too saw heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. And that's our mercy seat. That's our propitiation. That's our golden covering over the law which we have broken. It's Jesus Christ. Clearly the way is open for the church even now to enter the holy place where Christ has gone before. But the opening of the temple at this point signifies the imminent return of Christ to earth. You see, doors open two ways, don't they? Uh, or rather, if a door is open, you can come in or out. The, the temple in heaven is open not so that we can go in. We've been, we can go in now. The temple in heaven is open because he's coming out. Jesus is coming. That's the picture. Returning to this earth. Clearly, this is accompanied by great signs of 